Welcome. My name is Don Sol. I'm a professor at London Business School. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about strategy and its discontents. Now in the first podcast in this series, we talked about the l traditional view of strategy, a very linear view, which sees first a plan, then implementation, then sustaining a competitive advantage, protecting what you've got into the distant future. Has a lot of attractions, very logical, appeals to our need for control, but one fatal flaw. And that fatal flaw is this. It fails to incorporate new information that would influence the formulation of the strategy. And in uncertain markets, that is a fatal flaw indeed. So if the linear approach to strategy doesn't work, what can we use instead? What I propose is that we abandon the linear strategy, the linear view of strategy. It's fundamentally broken. And replace it with a view that sees strategy always and everywhere as unfolding through an iterative cycle. Now in the business context, that cycle takes uh, the form of the following four stages. First, you make sense of an uh, ambiguous, uncertain situation. Then you make choices, what to do, equally important what not to do. Then you make it happen, execute for that iteration. But then, importantly, you close the loop by making revisions based on the new information that execution has produced. So this linear uh, view doesn't work. The iterative view, however, takes new information into, uh, into account. It assumes that all strategy is work in progress, subject to revision in light of new data. It assumes that agile organizations must be in a constant and ongoing dialogue with shifting environments. And most importantly, it assumes that the best way to proceed forward into an uncertain future is in loops, not in lines. Now this iterative approach uh, to dealing with uncertainty, to strategy un under uncertainty, is so powerful that it's been adopted not only in business, but across other domains characterized by uncertainty. Venture capital, the military, the philosophy of science, new product development. And just to give you a flavor of how this plays out, I'll give some examples of the advantages of the iterative approach from these other domains. So first of all, this iterative approach reintegrates strategy formulation with strategy execution. Let me give you an example from the software uh, field. Traditional software programming is very linear. It's called a waterfall pro uh, process where you first plan it, then you divvy out the bits to people. They go off, spend a year or two years f furiously working away, and at the end you'd integrate it again. However, uh, the process, for all its apparent logic and rigor, didn't work. Some studies have estimated less than 5% of all the software produced by this linear approach was used by users. Why? Did the programmers not do what they said? No, they did exactly what they said. It's just the world had changed. The technology had changed. Users' needs had changed in the interim. They produced what they said they would, but it was no longer useful. Software programmers currently, many of them have adopted an approach called agile programming where on a monthly basis the users who are articulating what the product should be meet with the programmers who are executing on it and they jointly work through what matters more and what matters less on an ongoing basis allowing the plan for the product to evolve in light of new information about the market as well as what's easy and what's hard technically. So the first advantage integrates strategy formulation with execution. The second advantage is that this iterative approach mitigates, does not eliminate, but mitigates managers' tendency to escalate commitment to a failed course of action. Now, venture capitalists have always adopted an iterative approach where they give uh, an entrepreneur some money based on their understanding of an opportunity. They make some choices about what to do in a round of funding and what not to do. The entrepreneur goes off and executes, but critically, there's a revision stage when the entrepreneur runs out of money or during bo regularly scheduled board meetings where the venture capitalists are asking, how did it go? Is it working? What are your underlying assumptions? Do they seem to be holding? What is the data telling us? All of this is a step to mitigate entrepreneurs' natural tendency to charge forward in a linear fashion even as negative data is coming forward. So second thing is, mitigates this danger, an iterative approach does, mitigates the danger of escalating commitment. The third benefit is that it improves timing. Now this is a subtle point, but an interesting one. It turns out in the military, the official doctrine of NATO and uh, the US Marine Corps, among others, explicitly views military battles and military conflict 
as iterative cycles, known as the Boyd Loop or the OODA Loop, uh, for those of you who are, have a military background. And the key and interesting point about this is rather than thinking about a, a, a battle in a linear approach, by thinking of it in iterative approaches, it chunks time up into smaller pieces. And if a, an army or a group can be a little better and a little quicker than their adversary at going through this loop, time slows down for them. Whereas for their adversary, they're always on the back foot, always taken by surprise, always responding. And the combination of the chunking of time and adversaries on their back foot allows military personnel to time when they want to deliver the decisive blow. It helps improve their timing. So, the punchline of this podcast is very simple. The linear approach to strategy should be relegated to the dustbin of history. An iterative approach to strategy is a better replacement, at least in uncertain markets. Now, sounds great in theory. How do we do it in practice? That's the question we'll pick up in our next podcast. Thank you.